Father. Heavenly Father, I'm asking as we delve into your word this morning that in a very specific way you bring everybody to a place that is deeper in Christ. I'm asking that everyone here will have deep encounters with the Holy Spirit and his word. I'm asking that there'll be renewal for everyone here that is discouraged. Everyone that is spiritually weak, there'll be renewal, there'll be refreshing. Oh Lord, there's already refreshing because we're in your presence. I'm praying that there'll be energization by the Holy Ghost. I'm praying that people will be lifted, questions in the heart will be answered. No one here will go back the same way. The one that doesn't know Jesus will have an encounter today. I'm praying that everyone here that is with the burden, that the anointing will destroy every burden. And the word of God will meet everyone at the point of their needs. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Can you shout a believing amen? Praise the Lord. It's glory to God. We're going to start in our teaching today from Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26. And this is the month where we talk about it's God's will for us to do well financially. And for all of you that are doing well financially, you know, you can always just be like, well, I mean, I don't really need that. I've got my finances in order. But the thing, but why do we teach it? That's the important thing. Why do we teach it? Number one, you know, there's no topic you teach in church that some people are not very good at. So when you teach about prayer, some people are like, my prayer life is good. But the reason why you teach is this. Every time you teach, you build faith in that area. And God only confirms what is being taught. God only confirms what is being taught. Mark says it this way, Mark 16. It says, and the Lord working with them, confirming their words with signs and wonders. Only what is thought is being confirmed. So, you know, very powerful. Only what is taught is being what? Confirmed. Only what is taught is being confirmed. Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26. The Bible says this, And the Lord said unto, and God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So, what that means is this, that man was designed to look like God. So, when you see God, God is not going to have two heads or three heads. God is going to have one head with two eyes and one nose and mouth because God was your prototype. You were designed to look like God. He says, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let him have dominion. And that's the purpose of man right now. He says, let man have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. He says, hey, Let's make man and let have let man have dominion. Look at verse twenty. Um, look at verse twenty-eight. Verse twenty-eight. The Bible says in verse twenty-eight, and God blessed him, and God said unto man, Be fruitful and multiply. And that's very powerful. Just imagine the first words that man ever heard from the mount of God was be fruitful. Like the first words that man ever heard from the mount of God. Hey, be fruitful. He said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish yourself upon the earth and subdue it. It says, replenish yourself upon the earth and subdue it. And this is very powerful. This is very, very powerful. So, in all of this, what I wanted to see first was this. Okay, I think I have some announcements I missed. I... Father's Day is on June the 16th. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I guess we'll still have some more Sundays before that. So I don't have to really go ahead and talk about that a lot. All right. So the Bible says this. Back to the scripture, please. The Bible says in verse 28. It says, and God blessed him and said, let them. It says, and God said, be fruitful and multiply. So this is what I'm trying to say to you. God blessed man and said, man, be fruitful. You need to have the mentality that you are blessed. Not You need to think it, you need to know it, you need to leave it. The reason why is that any truth that you are not aware of will never work for you. Satan will take advantage of your ignorance. And let me say this quickly here. Do you know there are people that are not born again but have a deep feeling that God loves and bless them? And because they feel that way, it actually works for them. I know people that will tell you that, you know what? May I know they go church, oh, but I deep down I know say God bless me. And they have that courage, and that courage works in everything they do. But God's people that are really blessed by God, sometimes they work as if they do not know they are blessed. And I'll give you an example. 
One of the first times I ever went to South Africa, I booked into this hotel, and um, the hotel already was, you know, was, was quite a price for me at that time. And I booked into this hotel, and every morning when I woke up, I would go outside, try to buy like bread and butter. I just went, bought bread, butter, and jam, because I was like, I couldn't afford to pay any extra meal for hotel breakfast. So I bought bread, butter, and jam. So, and crackers. So in the morning, I'll just drink water, bread, butter, and jam. I mean, that's all I could afford. So every morning when I got down the stairs, either I was going to buy the bread or I was going out of the hotel. You know, the way the hotel was structured, you had to pass through the restaurant to go out of the hotel. The, the restaurant attendant would say, hello, sir, are you joining us for breakfast? And I would say, no, I'm not. And I would go like that. And it was about a 10 days trip there about. By the 10th day, by the ninth or 10th day, just the day I was leaving, I was like, you know what? I know this breakfast is expensive, but at least let me eat it once so that I also had the memory that I had this nice breakfast. It was really large breakfast, almost like tables here, tables there, live chef, you know, omelette. You can have bacon. You can have all of this. things, continental breakfast, English breakfast, intercontinental local breakfast. Everything was there, you know cereals on this side eggs on this side different kind of bread different kind of just everything was there so eventually the last day i said i'm going to eat so when i got there brothers and sisters i ate i ate what i should have eaten in 10 days i ate that's an exaggeration so when it was time to pay the bill i said bring the bill so they brought the bill to me and the man says sign i said yeah how much is it he said no it's in your room I said, what did you say? Oh, he said, the breakfast comes with the room. Hey. Hey, and I've been eating bread and butter and jam and crackers. All these days, it was the last day when I wanted to fly. You know the one that paid me the most? And I said, okay. Now I didn't eat this nine days. Would they refund me back? No, he said it's not refundable. He says either you eat it or you lose it. The same thing with spiritual things. What you don't know, you can't take advantage of. Praise God. What you don't know, you can't take advantage of. So the question is, as the Bible says, and God blessed man and say, be fruitful. Listen, I'm blessed to be fruitful. So, I'm not looking for the blessing. I'm a blessed person. So, when they say poverty is following someone, it's not me. I'm a blessed person. My bank account may not reflect it. My house may not reflect it. But don't confuse it. I'm blessed. Just a function of time, the blessing will manifest. And you need to be convinced that within yourself that I'm blessed. And when I do a transaction, when I do a project, when I start a shop, when I start a business, I expect it to do well because I am blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And you know, the Bible says in verse 28, just the same way we're reading. He says, and God told him, Genesis 1 verse 28. He says, be fruitful and multiply replenish the earth and subdue it when it says subdue it it means that there'll be time that things will want to go against it force it back let, 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 let me show you did how did, did this show subdue it let me show you subdue it this is what subdue it looks like inflation devaluation high prices is coming against your vision it says use the blessing and subdue it use the blessing and what subdue it it didn't say this will not go wrong. It said use the blessing and what? Subdue it. So when the pressure of life is coming, you, you lose your job, you lose your money, you lost capital, sales went against you, the dollar FX works against you, and you're almost there. Just remember you are blessed. From your down position, cha 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 subdue it. Praise God. So it didn't say things will not go wrong with against you. He said, but whatever goes wrong, do what? Subdue it. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 26 verse 12. Let's look at someone that subdued it. And we're going to go. I want us to go faster. Genesis chapter 26 verse 12. Hallelujah. So, you know, some of you are doing so well here. And deep down, there's a big fear in your, in your heart. It might, it might be a small fear. 
and it says, you know, you can lose everything. The reason why you will destroy that fear is this. I'm not doing what because I have money. I'm doing what because I'm blessed. You know what that means? The blessing will keep what it brought. What the blessing brings, the blessing will keep. Because God does not do half done projects. What the blessing bring the devil, what, what the blessing brings, the blessing what will keep. Can I even shock you? If you take my stuff, if I have the blessing, I will retrieve them back. Because the root is in me. The root is not in the building. The root is not in the business. The root is in me. So if it's lost, I will get it back because of the blessing. Look at it. I want to show you what the blessing does. The blessing works everywhere. The Bible says in Genesis 26 verse, 20, verse 12. Let's go to the Passion Translation. Let's read that. I don't have the time to just read the two translation. Passion Translation. Passion Translation, please. The Bible says this. Then Isaac sold in that land and received the hundredfold. They will soon change it to Passion Translation. And the Lord blessed them. So normally people use this kind of scripture for like giving and offering and all of those kind of things. But the truth is that this scripture is not about giving and offering. This scripture talks really about an agric economy. Isaac was a farmer. You know, Isaac was a farmer. And, you know, as a farmer, he just, you plant. The problem here was that it was a recession. There was a famine. So there was no rain. So because there was no rain, every other farmer had a loss. The Bible says, and Isaac planted crops in that land and took in a huge harvest. It was abnormal because there was no rain. So how did Isaac take in a huge harvest? By the power of the blessing. The Bible says, and God blessed him. Did you see that? The reason why he took a huge harvest was because God blessed him. The Bible says, and the man got richer and richer by the day until he was very great. Do you see what the blessing does? And he accumulated flocks and herds and many, many servants, so much so that the Philistines begin to envy him. The next line, and they got back at him. They got back at him by throwing debt and debris into the well that his father had dug back in the days of his father Abraham, clogging up all the well. But see the next thing. This is very powerful. This is what the blessing does. The next verse, please. The next verse. The Bible says, and finally, when they had done everything to, they have spoken bad about him to the governor, they have told the minister something else, told his boss something else, told the supplier something else. The Bible says, finally, Abimelech told Isaac, he said, leave. You have become too big for us. That is the work of the blessing. This year, you will hear that kind of statements. Hallelujah. In your industry, they will say, hey, 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 you, you can't be doing this. You have become too big for us. Amen. Every space you are playing in, you are going to hear you have become too big for us. If you believe, say, I receive it. It says you become too big for us. That's what the blessing does. Isaac should not do well because there was a famine. But the Bible says the blessing did that for him. And the reason I'm saying so is that I needed to keep thinking I'm blessed. I know the dollar rate is high. I know the fuel rate is high. I know gasoline is high. I know that interest rate is high. I know that things are tough. But you need to remind yourself, I have the blessing. Listen to me, the blessing subdues every other thing. Glory to God. That's so good. That's so good. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. That's you. So the question now is that, so if we are blessed, you know, why do some of us struggle financially? And for some of people, you figure that out already that this is the reason I'm not struggling financially. But there are people in your organization where you work, there are family members you have, and you see them struggling financially. What will you tell them from God's word? This is what you tell them from God's word. Why do people struggle financially? Second Kings chapter 4 in verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 4 in verse 1. One of the major reasons why people struggle financially or struggle in their businesses is because of the mindset. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 1. The Bible says, And there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet unto Elisha, saying, My servant, thy servant, my husband is dead. And you know that my servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be born men. They, they loaned money and they couldn't pay back. And the person they owed money has come now and wants to take the two sons. Then verse 2. The Bible says in verse 2. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? And he says, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, thy handmaid has not anything. In other words, your handmaid has nothing save a pot of oil long and short of the story the woman kept on saying that i don't have anything she didn't realize that the pot of oil 
was all she needed for a breakthrough. And let me say this to you, everyone. Here. Please pay, pay attention. Number one mindset people have that holds them back financially is a negative mindset. It's a scarcity mindset. What is the scarcity mindset? It's not enough. People just believe it's not enough. You know, it's a scarcity mindset. What's the scarcity mindset? It's not enough. I don't have enough. So, you, you know, you, you, you ask people, what is it? It's not enough. So, some people genuinely believe that it's not enough to go around. I don't believe that. What I believe is that the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. I believe, that's what I believe. That the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. So, the more you believe that there's scarcity, the more you see scarcity. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, some people have scarcity mentality. It's not enough. And it's not enough is pushed by the wealthy so that the poor will not hustle. And some people say, well, it's, you know, well, I don't know if it's enough or not, but I don't have. I, I never have enough. I never have enough. And let me say this quickly, and this is very powerful. This woman, every time you have scarcity mentality, scarcity mentality will blind you to the resources that you have. Scarcity mentality what? It will blind you to the resource that you have. The woman had a pot of oil. And the pot of oil was the trigger to a miracle. But she could not see it. Because scarcity mentality had blinded her. Scarcity mentality will blind you to what? The resource you have. And that's why everyone that is stuck here, ask yourself your question. Am I really stuck or my mind is helping you not see what I should see? Glory to God. And if you're stuck, if you're stuck financially and things are terrible financially, I want you to listen to this story. Very powerful story. Oprah was sharing a story about how she was broke. Oprah said there was a time in her life where she was broke, she was in debt, she didn't have a roof over her head and she was really struggling. And she came and asked herself, what can I do? He said, money I don't have, this I don't have, this I don't have, this I don't have. And that's what scarcity mentality does. It focuses on what you don't have. She now asks herself, okay, I don't have all those things. What do I have? He said, what I have is that I remember when I was three, five, seven, eight, ten, primary school, secondary school, everybody keep telling me, Oprah, you can talk. Oprah, you can talk. He said, all I have is I can talk. How can I use this talking to make money for myself? You know what I'm saying? So, eventually, what made Oprah phenomenal was that she was able to groom her talking. She was able to monetize her mon talking until she became very successful. I'm saying this to you because everyone that says, I'm stuck, I have nothing, things are not working. What you have to do is to look inside. There's something that you have that can change you. The challenge is this. Most people value other people's skill and opportunity and devalue their own. And as long as you devalue what is in your hand, it will never grow. Praise God. As long as you keep looking down at what is in your hand, it will never grow. And it's not as if you don't have something. But the challenge is that you keep devaluing. And let me give you my personal story. As a pastor, you know, you know what you said? When you start pastoring and you see all these big pastors, then you become intimidated. Because you're like, ah, our church is small. So one day, you know, I heard Pastor Paul has a drug preach. And Pastor Paul will go, my God. God. <laughs> I said, ah, that's the way you preach for people. Correct, but come to your church. <laughs> Me too, I practice. I said, my God. <laughs> Someone said, I said, Pastor, what were you trying to do today exactly? Then, you know, I, I said, maybe that Pastor Paul's method is not working. Let me talk like Bishop Deco. If you can't think, you will stink. <laughs> Puberty is your problem. The thing is that I forgot that if they want to see them, they'll go to their churches. They're here to see me. The more I devalued my gift, the more I overvalued their gift. The problem is this. Until you celebrate what you carry, people cannot celebrate it with you. Glory to God. I'm telling you. And, and you know the thing? Gift is gift. Oh. Gift is unique to every person. Gift is like fingerprints. You must learn to, and this is amazing, 25 years ago, there was no comedy industry. Now, comedy industry is multi-billion. 
Some years ago, we never used to have ushers in party. Now that is multi billion. We never even used to have caterers. We used to have cookers, people that will cook for parties. Now we have caterers because there were some people that believed in their gifts. They hewn their gift, they grew their gift, and they monetized their gift. The question is that what gift do you have that you're sleeping on? Elisha asked the woman, he said, what do you have? He says, he, says, he says, I have nothing save a pot of oil. Elisha said, that is enough. Do you know that I met a lady, I met a lady and I said, what, you, what do you do? He said, I'm a finger model. I said, what does that mean? He said, my fingers, I model my finger. I said, for who? He said, for jewelry companies, for these companies. He said, it's my fingers they need. My face will not be pretty, but my fingers are very nice. He said, my, some of my deals are about $350,000. Stop looking down on your gift. Stop, stop devaluing your gift and stop devaluing your gift and becoming desperate for another person's gift and opportunity. Whatever God gives you will make a way for you. He said the gift of a man will make room for him, not the gift of another man. He said your own gift that you have, the conviction you need is that you are gifted. So look at the gift and grow it. Someone say hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. And let me say something to you carefully here. If whatever you're doing is small and it's discouraging you, if whatever you're doing is not growing as you would do, don't complain. The reason why is that by complaint and comparison, you will destroy what you have. You will only grow what you have by thanksgiving. Maybe you're believing God for a store. And what you have is the corner shop far in the, in the outer lands. Keep thanking God for it. Thanksgiving gross things. Did you hear that? Gratitude gross things. Thanksgiving gross things. Complaining and comparison destroys them. And that was why Jesus Christ, he was going to feed 5,000 multitudes. You know what he did? God gave him five loaves. He didn't say, Lord, I said 5,000 multitudes. He said five loaves. He took the five bread. And he said, let's start with that. Let's begin to thank God. He started and thanked God for it. And before you know it, the bread multiplied. Maybe the reason why what was going well began to get destroyed, become smaller in your life, was that instead of you to be grateful, you began to compare and you began to be ungrateful. You began to complain and it began to shrink and shrink. Remember, everyone that complained in the wilderness did not reach the promised land. The only people that read the promised land were those that were grateful. If you are in the wilderness season of your life, listen and listen well. The worst thing to do is to complain. Because if you complain, you will die in the wilderness. What you have to do is in the wilderness be grateful. Don't say, well, remember the garlic of Egypt. You will die there. Oh. Just say, Father, I thank you. I'm not where I used to be. I'm not where I'm going to. But I'm making progress. I give you praise. Thanksgiving will take you there. That's a great time to clap for the Lord. Praise the Lord. The second mentality that people have is this, that gets them into financial. So the first mentality people have is this, is that number one, scarcity mentality. The second mentality people have is consumer mentality. What is consumer mentality? When you eat more than what you produce. Oh yes, when you eat more than what you produce. Question, how do you get into debt by eating more than what you produce? Yeah. Consumer mentality. Some people spend the future at the expense of today. Consumer's mentality. Why do people get into financial trouble? Consumer's mentality. You know, the, one of the most shameful things I've seen is when men try to marry women for money. I mean, I, I mean, real life story that there's a guy, you know, talking to the lady I knew, eventually they got married because he thought by marrying the lady, he will have access to his father's wealth, to her father's wealth. Eventually they got married two years, he didn't have access, divorced the lady and moved on. Consumer's mentality. How can you be a grown man? And your dream in life for success, your strategy to success is that I will find a rich 
girl from a rich family and I will marry her. Is it because you believe that there's nothing in you that can produce? Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Consumer mentality. I, I remember, I remember someone that I, I went to school with. We saw recently and we're just gisting. And <laughs> hey, my God. We saw, I mean, this was a while ago, I think about three years ago. We saw recently and we're just gisting. And she just come, we went to school together. She said, I, she said I, I even wanted to borrow me money. I said, but I know you not borrow me because you asked what I want to use it for. I said, okay, what do you want to use the money for? He said, look at me now. He said, look at me, I'm just big, big, big. He said, if I, if I can just do surgery and slim down, I'm slim down. Ah, the kind of guys that will attract. He said, it's an investmental, it's an investmental. He said, if you just give me maybe 15,000 to do my body now in one year. He said, it's an investmental. I said, Jesus Christ. Has he come to this? But this is the reality of what we live in. Consumer's mentality. And that's how people, some nations are called third world nations. Once you say third world nation, all it means is that you consume more than you produce. Simple. So ask yourself, are you a consumer? Do you consume more than what you produce? You earn 200,000 naira, but you spend 500,000 naira. Why won't you be begging all the time? Consumer mentality. And that's why sometimes in relationship now, see, some people are not looking for love, they're looking for sponsor. Sometimes people say, ah, I'm single, I'm praying for the right man. They are not praying for the right man. They are not looking for love, they're looking for a sponsor. They are looking for someone that will just sponsor their life and add love to it. And that's how when they get married, they find the money, but they don't find the love. If you have consumer's mentality, you'll be consumed. Be careful lest you're consumed. Glory to God. So don't be that kind of person. You know, sometimes I, I tell people, okay, oh, I'm just looking for love, someone to love me. But deep down, and you must realize every relationship is sustained by value. Ah, everyone that loves you loves you because you add value to their life. Oh, the day you stop adding value, the love will vanish. And that's when I when I hear this talk online and say when a woman says, "All I bring to the table is myself," you can't listen to me. That is too small to bring to the table. You have to bring more than that, because what you are bringing to the table is not unique. You can't be offering us something that has diminishing return. It will finish one day now. Praise God. It's true because the guy is excited because he has not done it. And after one, two, three, four, ten times, they're like, what, what is new here? But after that, there's now brain. He should leave you alone now and see if you find someone that has your kind of brain to support him. Praise God. I know you are women with brains here now. Ah, how can you be coming to harvesters? I don't. Ah, <laughs> these harvesters, oh. All the ladies say amen. Glory to God. The third mentality, the third mentality that affects people. So, one mentality, you know why mentality are powerful? Mentality are your thought pattern. So, once you have that consumer, see, you don't understand. <laughs> Lord, help me. How do you want to do marriage and, your, and in planning for your marital finances, you plan that people will give you money to do your marriage? Does it not show that you lack critical wisdom? You say, my wife, this one will buy cake, this one will buy wedding gown, this one will buy this. Even for your wife, this one will buy something for your wife. It just shows me that you are either not ready to marry or the marriage is too big for your financial size. Cut your coat according to your material. Size care. Your size can be too big. 
cut your coat according to material. If you can only do top, you do top. If you can only do boxers, you do boxers. You leave trouser alone. Can, can we be honest here? Some of you, Uber has passed your financial level. Let's be honest though. Because when you look at your budget, 95% of budget, Uber, Uber, Uber has passed your financial level. It's not every year you must go on vacation though. Some years, your vacation is the Diroko. Badagri. You go there, you enjoy the sea. You say, wow, we are sea. You enjoy the Bene Sea. You know, I say, wow, we're at this level. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Consumer mentality. How do you know I'm a consumer? I consume more than I produce. Once you cannot live within your income, you are what? A consumer. Glory to God. I say 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 glory to God. Another mentality that affects people financially is entitlement. Entitlement. When you think other people owe you, Every time man disappoints me, it's a reminder that I'm looking in the wrong direction. Every time man disappoints me, it's a reminder that I'm looking in the wrong direction. And instead of putting pressure on man to do something, put pressure in prayer. Some of you right now, you are not talking to a certain friend, a certain family member, and the reason why is that they promised them they did something. It is in man to fail. So what you do is that every time you feel disappointed, you say, ah, thank God for reminding me. My trust was in man. You change your focus to God. Because if you keep looking at man, you will miss God. If you keep looking at man, you will miss God. And sometimes in God's divine orchestration, it allows man to disappoint you so that nobody can take the glory. Because if man supports you, man will say, I did it. So, because God wants to do it, he does it in such a way that nobody can take the glory. Praise God. I say, praise God. I say, praise God. I say, praise God. The biggest miracles in the Bible, if you watch it very well, God did it in such a way that nobody could declare, I took the glory. And that's why sometimes man disappoints. Because God works it in a way. God knows that if this person gives you the job, if this person gives you the money, what they will show you after, he knows it. So what he does is that he takes David from the backside of the desert that nobody saw and brought him to the palace. So that nobody can even say, I was the one that helped you. So when man disappoints you, don't cry. God is just working it as in such a way that only him will get the glory and no man will say, this is my work. And everyone that's appointed, you go back and release and forgive them. Because that will show you. Let me tell you something. Pastor, you don't understand. It's the fact of my child that refused to pay the bills. Let him not pay. With him not paying. When he sees your child in Harvard and he remembers he has not paid, he will look at you and say, by yourself you did this, will say that is what it means when he says God that is at work in me but to will and to do of his good pleasure that this is the work of the Lord someone say hallelujah someone say hallelujah you must be careful of entitlement I was I, you know just the other day online I, I saw a post one girl said to her boyfriend you are very irresponsible I ask you to buy me air for 1.7 million. Just air for 1.7 million. I, I mean, this is a wonderful story. This is, this, is a, this is a very touching story. The girl is writing and sending it. He said, never call me again. I ask you to buy me ordinary air, 1.7 million. Two months, you've been posting me, posting me. The guy now replied and said, I'm irresponsible because I could not buy you air for 1.7 million. He said, your father must be irresponsible also. He said, because couldn't your father, and I'm not, I'm not advocating violence. 
But the question is this. Ladies, eh? Some of these things you ask your boyfriend. Maybe you have brothers. Maybe you have a dad. Test it on them. And when you test it on them, if you say they're irresponsible, just remember that the person that you also ask for your family, test it on them. You know why? Sometimes because of poverty, we don't know what is normal again. I'm telling you, sometimes, you know, there's way poverty really wires your mind. I, I met a guy abroad, he said, I can never date a black man again in my life. I said, why? He said, black women. He said, my white girlfriend, I date her, no financial pressure. He said, I look at my bank account, I see how much I spend. He said, when I spend on that, she said, you're spending too much. There's another part to it. So sometimes women also do it because of they want to be sure you can carry financial weights. But the thing is that you must be careful lest you overdo it. The guy is 28. Where will he find 1.7 million naira for? Maybe your own brother is 29. He does not even have a car. Praise God. I said, praise God. Entitlement mentality. Entitlement mentality. You ask someone abroad for money. You say that, ah, they sent you 5K. You say, ah, if abroad is not working, come back home. Oh. Come back home. Oh. If abroad is not working, come back home. Oh. If London is not working, come back home. Oh. If it's not working, come back home. Oh. My brother, carry visa, go and walk in the snow. See how difficult it is. Then send money home. When they were going to work, you didn't pay visa fee, you didn't pay ticket fee, you didn't pay school fees, you paid nothing. And the truth is that until you work, you never value money. Praise God. So sometimes people struggle, people, so we're saying this, you know, people struggle because of entitlement mentality. And that leads them to live in. This is another major thing. People live above their means. Stop living fake life. The goal is not to look rich. The goal is to be rich. Stop wearing googie. It is Gucci. And I'm saying so because, I'm saying so because, we see, in trying to, in, in you living fake life, you keep pushing your helpers away because your helpers think you don't need help. Meanwhile, you need help desperately. Fake life. And we're trying to impress people with what we don't have. People that do not care about us at all. They don't even remember what you wore. Ask your friend, what did I wear last Sunday? You cannot remember. But yet, now you have gone to buy another style. You have gone to buy another style. Leave your size per time. Stop living beyond your means. Why are you getting loan to fund lifestyle? Don't, don't you think that's a mental problem? The glasses it has to be deal the belt has to be lv the shoe has to be gucci the other one has to be louboutin with everything only that the problem that you're owing <laughs> let me tell you something if you have financial pressure most of the time you put it with your hand it's not the work of the enemy it's the fact you couldn't balance it let me tell you what helped me and this helped me i was i'm not in a hurry to get expensive things because i remember i remind myself i have a lifetime what i can get today i will get tomorrow the goal is not to look rich the goal is to be rich life is a marathon It's not what to call first is what will finish some people will be shining first in the next 20 years they will start begging again Life is a marathon. It's not about who took off first. It's who will finish. And let me say something to you. Everyone, please listen. 
no matter how old you are, your bigger expense are in your future. All of you that below 30, you have no expenses, trust me. Because you don't have kids in schools. If you have kids in school, you don't have kids in major schools. When your kids start going to university, you will now understand why you thought your parents were careless. How you two were careless. When you start paying bills. And this is the time to fix it. Someone say hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Which of this mentality are you struggling with? I'm telling you, can I advise all of you that are doing marriage and doing Ashwebi have mercy? Ashwebi 350,000 that's two months salary. Calm down. Ah, I you not put them under pressure. I say, if you are my loyal friend, if you're my gang, if you are close to me, you will buy this, you will buy this. It's just one time wedding, 350,000. You are the one that is wedding, we're not wedding with you now. And listen to me. <laughs> the fact that I wear a shabby doesn't mean I can't be your enemy. Oh. Are you hearing me? Judas ate with Jesus Christ. He betrayed him. John Aramatia did not even know Jesus Christ. He saved him. The person that carried the cross, Joseph, Joseph the Cyrene, nobody heard about him. Sometimes the people that will carry your cross are not the people that eat with you. So the fact that they wore a shabby doesn't mean that you are your friends. Be careful. Oh. So you tell your friend... Even I don't where I should be, I'm your friend in the spirit. That's fine. Glory to God. We just put ourselves under pressure for what is not important. Your friend can afford to, to put their children in boarding school in London at the pound rate. That's great, but can you afford it? And you begin to put your husband under pressure because of what your friend is doing. I've told you, comparison destroys what is good. Your friend is not going to a good school. Your child is going to a good school here. But you have come under pressure because you're comparing him to your other friend. And that's why you have low pressure. Because every time you're calculating, 2 plus 2 plus 4, you're just trying to add up. Someone say hallelujah. Let's close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Who? Have we taken some lessons today? Yeah. The way financial freedom works is this. There's going to be a period of deprivation. Then there's going to be a period of what? Enjoyment. It's pay today, play later. Or play today and pay later. It's very good to pay today and play later. Make a decision to leave many layers below and what you earn. Can I give you advice? Can I give you an advice? First of all, if you have debt, get out of it. Work very hard to get out of your debts. Number two, make sure you have savings of six months of your income in case you lose your job. And don't say God forbid. I'm not saying God does not forbid. I'm just saying have wisdom. <laughs> because there are some times that God has forbidden, but the prayer is working, but the job has not come. What will you live on? Most people that you think are rich because of the job they have are not rich. They only have an opportunity to be rich. Because a job means J-O-B, just over broke. So I say have a job, I just over what? Broke. So have some savings, six months. If something goes wrong, I have something to go back and live at. Do you know a lot of girls live with guys in Lagos? Not because they love them. Because they have no place to go. If you can cut your coat according to your size. Living in Lekki does not mean you are successful. I hope you know that. You live with a guy. You cook. You cook. You have sex. You cook, laundry, have sex, fight. Sometimes your friends are coming over. You would. It's not important. Peace of mind is important. And then this morning, I will just threaten you. I will throw you out. And because you know you have no place to go to, you just behave. (laughs) 
Praise the Lord. And let me tell you something. This world is wicked though. Because yeah, my friends will help me. This world is wicked. You saw the video of the singer beating the girlfriend, smashing her face. Someone was recording, but they could not stop him. Someone was recording, but they could not stop him. Human beings, they will record to post. It would rather go viral than for it to be stopped. That's how human beings are. So you must be careful when you call friends because some of the friends, their effort was to record, but they could not stop. May God give you friends that when you are in trouble, they will speak for you. Someone say hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll close from here. In verse 6. In verse 6. Glory to God. The Bible says this, and this I say unto you, and he which soweth spirit, now he's talking about giving, giving, and it's just saying, using the metaphor, like when you give, when it says give sparingly, it means that if you give in a stingy way, if you give in a bountiful way, it's just using that word. It says, and he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He that gives, you know, in a very, there's a way you give, and it's like, um, I give what is convenient, I give this tiny thing. He said, what will happen is that there will be a response, which will also be, tiny and he which sows bountifully anyone that is extravagant and generous with his giving shall reap also bountifully and this is why giving this is why generosity is powerful see verse 7 now verse 7 says something powerful okay you can give me this verse 6 in the passion translation first in the passion verse 6 in the passion translation first is it possible or it's going to take some time it says here is my point a stingy sower will reap a major, a tiny harvest. But the one who sows from a general spirit will reap an abundant harvest. And, and that's very important. Look at verse, verse 7. We can go back to King James now. We can leave it here. It says, let giving flow from your heart. Not from a... See, and this is it. And this is why I hate the manipulation of churches. Where you're like, a pastor comes and says, like, if, you, if you need the blessing, you need to give to an 50,000 there. There's nothing like that. God's blessings are not for sale. You can't you can be like, if you don't give this, you can't be blessed. God's blessings are not for sale. That is an exaggeration, a manipulation of truth. And let me just want church people, because church people, sometimes you behave as if you didn't go to school. If someone tells you that the only way to be successful in life is to give your tithe and offering, ask them, what did Elon Musk give? What did Dan Gote give? The Bible says that the hand of the diligent shall bear rule. He says, see a man diligent, he shall stand before kings. Giving is powerful, but diligence is also powerful. Because sometimes church people, you hear these things and really doesn't, they say for you to be married, you must give a $1,000 seed for you to be married. Come on. All your friends are married. Did they give a $1,000 seed? Apart from that, why are we taking $1,000 seed in Nigeria? Is this our currency? Calm down. I believe in giving, but let's remove the manipulation. And I want to teach you the real Bible way to give. He says, look at verse 7. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. And that's why a lot of people that tithe, this is why it doesn't work. Because you feel as if God is judging with a cloth saw. If you don't tithe, it will smash your head. He says, when you give, it must flow from what? From your heart, not a religious duty. Let it spring forth from you with the joy of giving. He say, all because God loves what? Hilarious generosity. The, the way to give is as important as giving. How do you give? Hilarious generosity. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 is very powerful. Verse 8 is very powerful. He says, he says this. Give, give me verse 8 in King James. You know, or maybe amplified. I, 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 King James first. Then I'll move to amplified. You know, I'm not very used. I'm, yeah. See what King James says here. Move to verse 7 in King James. Just verse 7. Then I'm most amplified. It says, every man as he has proposed in his heart, let him give. It says, not grudgingly of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. God, giving is going to pain for you. But God loves say that, hey, you're not trying to manipulate me. You're not trying to get something. God loves the fact that you're cheerful. Have you ever, have you ever taken from money from someone before? And you're not willing to give them. How did you feel? Think of Nigerian police. 
Be like. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want to say, ha! That's what God wants. Don't give to God as if he's terrorizing you. So look at the blessing. This is verse 8 now. Verse 8 says, when you now give, and God is able to make all grace. This is the power of generosity. He said, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Grace works for you already. You know, hope you know that. But God says, I will take all grace and direct it towards you. Uh, my brother, play one key. That's powerful. That's one key. Now, play ten keys. It's different effect. God says, by the time you start giving, where one grace was working, he will take all grace and direct it towards you. See what it says? That you always have sufficiency in all things. And may have enough to abound to what every good work. Giving the amplified version. I'm going to close from here. What does giving do? Giving has a way to amplify grace. The amplified version. This is very powerful. This is very powerful. See, what, like, can we read together? Want to go? Is it okay to read together? Want to go? And God is able to make all grace, every oh my God, every favor and earthly blessing to come to you in abundance. So that you may always and under all circumstances, whatever the need be, be what? Self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support, furnishing abundance for every good work. Say this grace is working for me. Now, this grace does not come by prayer. It comes by giving. What does this mean? He says, he says, hey, Bashaya. He says, everywhere you've been doing instrumental payment, I, I will pay small, 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 small. He said, you will no longer need aid. You will just come and say, one time payment, one bullet. Bah. All of you are trying to pay for that deal. He said, everybody contribute 250 million. Uh, people are looking for bank, looking for partner. You say, my own is ready. Why? Because, because what? Grace is available. I require no aid or support. I'm furnished in abundance. Why? Because God has made all grace abound towards me. This is for the people that are generous. This is a blessing of generosity. So, when you see, when you see me being extra given in, in my giving, when you see someone extra given in, in their giving, this is what is happening. What is happening is that God is making all grace. See, I love what he says. He says every favor. You will just see, before you get to the office, they'll be like, ah, we'll be looking for you. Why? Because every favor has gone ahead of you. You know what I've noticed? When you have this blessing, take note of this. Before you get somewhere, God puts men there to favor your cause. That's how this blessing works. Before you get somewhere, God puts men there to favor your cause. In fact, when they are shuffling men, they are shuffling them for you. This blessing is so powerful that everyone connected to your rising, God will begin to raise them up. So some promotion and arrangement, rearrangement will take place. You know why they will take place? They will take place because God is using them to raise you up. And this is a power. Listen to me. If you're not that person that gives, if you're that person that gives stingily, you're not able to tithe, you're not a percentage giver, this is the reason why you must change. The reason why is that there's what I can do for myself, but that's not what I want. I want grace. People belong to secret courts to advance in life. When they get to secret cloth, they're looking for grace. Yes or no? Yes or no? Me, I don't belong to secret cloth. I belong to secret place. Me, I don't belong to secret court. I belong to what? Secret place. In secret court, they'll say, bring your mother's left eye. Bring your right testicles. Bring your left, wife's left breast. Bring this, bring that. Wear white. That's what they tell them. But in the secret place, we know our own. We enter with thanksgiving. We speak in other tongues. Then we come with our seed, our sacrificial seed. Then we connect to grace. Oh, somebody shall grace. Shall grace. Shall grace. Say, this is my story. Look at everybody say, some belong to secret courts. I belong to secret place. Where do you belong to? Stay somewhere. Look at them and say, stay somewhere. You can't be neutral. Let's stand up and pray. Glory to God. Hallelujah.
I wanted to declare that you are blessed. Declare that the blessing is working in your life. Go ahead and pray. Just you have one minute to pray. Go ahead and pray anywhere you are. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. Declare it. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Going in and coming out, I'm blessed. Declare that all grace is released to me. I have sufficiency requiring no aid or support. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm praying that the blessing from that scripture, that all grace will abound towards you will be your story. In a very practical way. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can have your seats.